Section eight of the most extraordinary trial of William Palmer by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Fourth day, May the seventeenth. Part two. Dr. Daniel. Examined by the Attorney General. I was for many years surgeon to the Bristol Hospital, but have been out of practice for some time. In the course of a long practice, I should think that I have seen at least thirty cases of tetanus. Two of those were certainly cases of idiopathic tetanus. One of them terminated fatally, the other did not. I quite agree with the other medical witnesses that idiopathic tetanus is a very rare occurrence in this country. The only difference in the symptoms between idiopathic and traumatic tetanus that I perceived was that the former were more modified not so severe in their character i was not able to trace these two cases of idiopathic tetanus to any particular cause i have heard the description given of the symptoms which accompanied the attack upon mr cook before his death and it appears to me that the circumstances of that attack are assuredly distinguishable from those which came under my experience in dealing with cases of tetanus the evidence of sir b brodie quite expresses my opinion with respect to the difference of the symptoms between ordinary tetanus and tetanic convulsions produced by strychnine tetanus begins with uneasiness in the lower jaw followed by spasms of the muscles of the trunk and most frequently extending to the muscles of the limbs lockjaw is almost invariably a symptom of those cases of tetanus of traumatic tetanus especially I do not recollect that clinching of the hands is a usual symptom of ordinary tetanus, nor do I remember any twisting of the foot. I do not believe that any of the cases which came under my experience endured for a shorter time than from thirty to forty hours. I never knew a case of syphilitic sore producing tetanus. The symptoms, as they have been described, certainly cannot be referable to apoplexy or epilepsy i never heard of such a thing in all the cases of tetanus which came under my observation consciousness has been retained to the last throughout the whole disease the symptoms have never set in in their full power from the commencement but have invariably commenced in a milder form and have then gone on increasing being continuous in their character and without intermission in my judgment the symptoms of the case of mr cook could not be referred either to idiopathic or traumatic tetanus cross-examined by mr grove q c i have not read dr curling's or dr copeland's books on the subject of tetanus nor have i of late studied much the reported cases i am not aware that excitement or irritation from vomiting has ever been given as the cause of tetanus the main symptoms of tetanus are in my opinion always very similar although the inferior symptoms may vary simply. I cannot undertake to say that the convulsions of tetanus arise from the spine. I do not like the term asphyxia, but I think that death from tetanic convulsions may probably arise from suffocation. It is many years since I saw a post-mortem upon a case of tetanus. I cannot say whether, in the case of death from suffocation, the heart would be full of blood or the reverse an examination of the spinal cord or marrow never so far as i know afforded evidence of the cause to which the tetanus was to be attributed mr samuel solly surgeon of st thomas's hospital examined by mr wellsby i have been connected with st thomas's hospital as lecturer and surgeon for twenty-eight years and during that time i have seen many cases of tetanus i have had six or seven under my own care and i may have seen ten or fifteen more of those cases it was doubtful in one whether the disease was idiopathic or traumatic the wound was so slight and the symptoms so obscure that it was difficult to decide which it was the others were all decidedly traumatic cases the shortest period that i recollect during which the disease lasted before it terminated in death was thirty hours the disease was always progressive in its character i have heard the description given by the witnesses of mr cook's attacks and they differ essentially from those cases which i have seen in my experience of tetanus there has always been a marked expression of the countenance as the first symptom 
it is a sort of grin and so peculiar that having once seen it you can never mistake it in the symptom that i heard detailed with regard to mr cook there were violent convulsions on monday night and on tuesday the individual was entirely free from any discomfort about the face or jaw whereas in the cases under my notice the disease was always continuous and the fixedness of the jaw was the last symptom to disappear in my judgment the symptoms detailed in mr cook's case are referable neither to apoplexy epilepsy nor to any disease that i have ever witnessed cross-examined by mr sergeant shee the sort of grin which i have described is known as rhesus sardonicus it is not common to all convulsions epilepsy is a disease of a convulsive character i heard the account given by mr jones of the last few minutes of mr cook's death that he uttered a piercing shriek and died after five or six minutes quietly that last shriek and the paroxysm which accompanied it bear in some respects the resemblance to epilepsy all convulsions which may be designated as of an epileptic character are not attended with an utter want of consciousness death from tetanus accompanied with convulsions seldom leaves any trace behind it but death from convulsions arising from epilepsy does leave its trace in the shape of a slight effusion of blood on the brain and a congestion of the vessels re-examined by the attorney-general the convulsions of epilepsy are accompanied by a variety of symptoms when a patient dies of epilepsy he dies perfectly unconscious and comatose i never saw any case of convulsive disease at all like this there are cases of convulsive disease which are similar to tetanus in their onset but not in their progress for example laceration of the brain a sudden injury to the spinal cord and the irritation from teething in infants will produce convulsions resulting in death but there would be wanting the marked expression of the face which i have described which i have never missed in cases of tetanus mr henry lee surgeon to king's college and to the lock hospital examined by mr bodkin the lock hospital is exclusively devoted to cases of a syphilitic character and at present i see probably as many as three thousand of those cases in the course of a year i have never known an instant of that disease terminating in tetanus by the court i have never seen or read of a case either of primary or secondary symptoms resulting in tetanus this witness was not cross-examined dr henry corbett physician of glasgow examined by mr james q c in september eighteen forty five i was medical clerk at the glasgow infirmary and i remember a patient named agnes sennett alias agnes french who died there on the twenty seventh of september eighteen forty five it was stated that she had taken strychnine pills which had been prepared for another patient in the ward and the symptom which accompanied her death were those of strychnine the pills were for a paralytic patient i saw her when she was under the influence of the poison and i had seen her the day before that perfectly well she had been admitted for a skin disease of the head when i saw her after she had taken the poison she was in bed the symptoms were these there was a strong reaction of the mouth the face was much suffused and red the pupils of the eye were dilated the head was bent back the spine was curved and the muscles were rigid and hard like a board the arms were stretched out the hands were clinched and there were severe paroxysms recurring every few seconds she died in about an hour and a quarter after taking the pills when i was first called the paroxysms did not last so long but they increased in severity according to the prescription there should have been a quarter of a grain of strychnine in each pill and this woman had taken three the paralytic patient was to have taken a pill each night or one each night and morning i forget which cross-examined by mr sergeant she the retraction of the mouth was continuous but it was worse at times i do not think that i observed it after death the hands were not clinched after death they were semi-bent she died an hour and a quarter after taking the medicine the symptoms appeared about twenty minutes after 
I tried to make her vomit with a feather, but failed. She only vomited partially after I had given her an emetic. Re-examined by the Attorney General. There was a spasmodic action and grinding of the teeth. She could open her mouth and swallow. There was no lockjaw or ordinary tetanus. By Mr. Sergeant Shee. I do not recollect that touching her sent her into paroxysms. Dr. Watson, examined by the Attorney General. I am a surgeon at the Glasgow Infirmary. I remember the case of Agnes Sennett. I was called in about a quarter of an hour after she was taken ill. She was in violent convulsions, and her arms were stretched out and rigid. The muscles of the body were also rigid, and were kept quiet by rigidity. She did not breathe, the muscles being kept still by titanic rigidity. That paroxysm subsided, and fresh paroxysms came on after a short interval. She died in about half an hour. She seemed perfectly conscious. I don't recollect the state of her hands. Her body was opened. The heart was found distended and stiff. The cavities of the heart were empty. My father published an account of the case. Cross-examined by Mr. Grove. The spinal cord was quite healthy. Dr. J. Patterson, examined by Mr. Wellesby. In 1845, I was engaged in the laboratory of the infirmary at Glasgow. I dispensed the prescriptions. I made up a prescription for a paralytic patient named McIntyre. It consisted of pills which contained strychnine. There were four pills and one grain of strychnine in the four. Baron Alderson. Was there any noise made about their being taken by the wrong person? Yes. Mary Kelly, examined by Mr. Bodkin. In September 1845, I was a patient in the Glasgow Infirmary. A paralytic patient was in the same ward, and I attended to her. There was also a patient named French, or Sennett, who was suffering from a sore head. She died. I was turning a wheel near the paralytic patient on the afternoon of the day Sennett died, for the purpose of applying something to her skin. There were some pills which she was to take near her. The paralytic woman took one and swallowed it according to the orders that had been given, and then handed the box to the girl with the sore head. The girl swallowed two of the pills, and then went and sat by the ward fire. She was taken ill in about three-quarters of an hour, and fell back on the floor, and I went for nurse. We took her to bed, and sent for the doctor. We were obliged to cut her clothes off, because she never moved. She was like a poker. I was by her side when she died. She never spoke after she fell down. Cross-examined by Mr. Sergeant Shee. It was three-quarters of an hour from the time she took the pills till she was taken to the bed. Caroline Hickson, examined by Mr. James. In October 1848, I was nurse and lady's maid to the family of Mr. Sergeantston Smith. The family were then residing about two miles from Romsey. On the 30th of October, Mrs. Smith was unwell. We dealt with Mr. Jones, a druggist in Romsey. A prescription had been sent to him to be made up for Mrs. Smith. The medicine was brought back about six o'clock in the afternoon. It was a mixture in a bottle. My mistress took about half a wine glass of it the following morning, at five or ten minutes past seven o'clock. I left the room when I had given it her. Five or ten minutes afterwards I was alarmed by the ringing of her bell. I went into her room and found her out of bed, leaning upon a chair, in her night-dress. I thought she had fainted. She appeared to suffer from what I thought were spasms. I ran and sent the coachman for Mr. Taylor, the surgeon, and returned to her. Some of the other servants were there assisting her. She was lying on the floor. She screamed loudly, and her teeth were clinched. She asked to have her arms and legs held straight. I took hold of her arms and legs, which were very much drawn up. She still screamed and was in great agony. She requested that water should be thrown over her, and I threw some. Her feet were turned inwards. I put a bottle of hot water to her feet, but that did not relax them. Shortly before she died, she said she felt easier. The last words she uttered were, Turn me over. We did turn her over on the floor. 
she died a few minutes after she had spoken those words she died very quietly she was quite conscious and knew me during the whole time about an hour and a quarter elapsed from the time i had given her the medicine till she died cross-examined by mr grove she could not sit up from the time i went up to her till she died it was when she was in a paroxysm that i endeavoured to straighten her limbs the effect of cold water was to throw her into a paroxysm it was a continually recurring attack lasting about an hour or an hour and a quarter her teeth were clinched during the whole time re-examined by the attorney-general the fit came on five or ten minutes after i gave her the medicine she was stiff all the time till within a few minutes after death she was conscious all the while mr francis taylor examined by mr wellesby i am a surgeon and apothecary at romsey i attended mrs sergeantson smith in eighteen forty eight i was summoned to her house one morning soon after eight and when i arrived i found her dead the body was on the floor near the bed the hands were very much bent the feet were contracted and turned inwards the soles of the feet were hollowed up and the toes contracted apparently from recent spasmodic action the inner edge of each foot was turned up there was a remarkable rigidity about the limbs by lord campbell the body was warm examination continued the eyelids were almost adherent to the eyeballs the druggist who made up the prescription was named jones i made a post-mortem examination three days after the death the contraction of the feet continued but it had gone off somewhat from the rest of the body i found no trace of disease in the body the heart was contracted and perfectly empty as were all the large arteries leading from it i analysed the medicine she had taken with another medical man it contained a large quantity of strychnine it originally contained nine grains and she had taken one-third three grains i made a very casual examination of the stomach and bowels as we had plenty of proof that poison had been taken without making use of tests cross-examined by mr sergeant she in cases of death from ordinary causes the body is much distorted it does not generally i should think remain in the same position after death if the body is not laid out immediately is it not stiffened by the rigor mortis probably it is the ankles were tied by a bandage to keep them together i commenced to open the body at the thorax and abdomen the head was also opened charles bloxham examined by mr huddleston i was apprenticed to mr jones the chemist at romsey in eighteen forty eight my master made a mistake in preparing a prescription for mrs smith the mistake was the substitution of strychnine for salicite bark of willow he destroyed himself afterwards jane witham examined by mr e james in march last i was in attendance upon a lady who died the learned counsel told the witness she had better not mention the lady's name she took some medicine after she took it she became ill she complained first of her back her head was thrown back her body stretched out and i observed twitchings her eyes were drawn aside and staring i put my hand upon her limbs which did not at all relax she first complained of being ill in that way on monday the twenty fifth of february and died on saturday the first of march she had attacks on the monday on the wednesday on the thursday on the friday a very slight one and at a quarter past eight o'clock on the saturday morning she died about twenty minutes to eleven that night between the attacks she was composed she principally complained of prickings in the legs and twitchings in the muscles and in her hands which she said she could compare to nothing else than a galvanic shock she wished her husband to rub her legs and arms she was dead when dr morley came cross-examined by mr sergeant she on the saturday night she could not bear to have her legs touched when the spasms were strong upon her her limbs were rigidly extended when she asked to be rubbed that was in the interval between the spasms touching her then brought on the spasms her body was stiff immediately after death but i did not stay long in the house on the saturday she was sensible from half an hour to an hour 
from a quarter past eight till after nine i suppose she was insensible the remainder of the time she did not speak re-examined by mr e james on the saturday before she died the symptoms were the same as on the other days not more violent mr morley examined by mr wellsby i am a surgeon i attended on the lady to whom the last witness has alluded for about two months before her death on the monday before she died she was in bed apparently comfortable when i observed as i stood by her side several slight convulsive twitchings of her arms i suppose they arose from hysteria and ordered medicine in consequence the same symptoms were repeated on the following wednesday or thursday i saw her on saturday the day she died she was apparently better and quite composed in the middle of the day she complained of an attack she had had in the night she spoke of pain and spasms in the back and neck and of shocks i and another medical man were sent for hastily on the saturday night we were met by the announcement that the lady was dead on the monday i accompanied another medical gentleman to the post-mortem examination we found no disease in any part of the body which would account for death there was no emaciation wound or sore there was a peculiar expression of anxiety about the countenance the hands were bent and the fingers curved the feet were strongly arched we carefully examined the stomach and its contents to see if we could find poison we applied several tests nitric acid chloride of sulphuric acid bichloride of potash in a liquid state and also in a solid state they are the best tests to detect the presence of strychnine in each case we found appearances characteristic of strychnine we administered the strychnine taken from the stomach to animals by inoculation we gave it to a few mice a few rabbits and a guinea pig having first separated it by chemical analysis we observed in each of the animals more or less the effects produced by strychnine namely general uneasiness difficult breathing convulsions of a tetanic kind muscular rigidity arching backwards of the head and neck violent stretching out of the legs these symptoms appeared in some of the animals in four or five minutes in others in less than an hour the guinea pig suffered but slightly at first and was left and found dead the next day the symptoms were strongly marked in the rabbits after death there was an interval of flaccidity after which rigidity commenced more than if it had been occasioned by the usual rigor mortis i afterwards made numerous experiments on animals with exactly similar results the poison being administered in a fluid form cross-examined by mr grove i did not see the patient during the severe attack i have observed in animals that spasms are brought on by touch that is a very marked symptom the spasm is like a galvanic shock the patient was not at all insensible during the time i saw her and she was able to swallow but i did not see her during a severe attack after death we found the lungs very much congested there was a small quantity of blood serum in the pericardium the muscles of the whole body were dark and soft there was a decided quantity of effusion in the brain there was also a quantity of serum tinged with blood in the membranes of the spinal cord the membranes of the spinal marrow were congested to a considerable extent we opened the head first and there was a good deal of blood flowing out part of the blood may have flowed from the heart that might partially empty the heart and would make it uncertain whether the heart was full or empty at the time of death i have often examined the hearts of animals poisoned by strychnine the right side of the heart is generally full in some cases i think that the symptoms did not appear for an hour after the administration of the poison i have made the experiments in conjunction with mr nunnally we have made experiments upon frogs but they are different in many respects from warm-blooded animals i have in almost all cases found the strychnine where it was known to have been administered in one case it was doubtful we were sure the strychnine had been administered in that case but we doubted whether it had reached the stomach there were appearances which might lead one to infer the presence of strychnine but they were not satisfactory i have detected strychnine in the stomach nearly two months after death when decomposition has proceeded to a considerable extent 
re-examined by the attorney general from half a grain to a grain has been administered to cats rabbits and dogs from one to two grains is quite sufficient to kill a dog how does the strychnine act is it taken up by the absorbents and carried into the system i think it acts upon the nerves but a part may be taken into the blood and act through the blood we generally examined the stomach of the animals when the poison had been administered internally sometimes we examined the skin the poison found in the stomach would be in excess of that absorbed into the system are you then of the opinion a portion of the poison being taken into the system and a portion being left in the stomach the portion taken into the system would produce tetanic symptoms and death mr sergeant she objected to a question which suggested a theory the attorney general what would be the operation of that portion of the poison which is taken into the system it would destroy life mr baron alderson and yet leave an excess in the stomach that is my opinion the attorney general would the excess remaining in the stomach produce no effect i am not sure that strychnine could lie in the stomach without acting prejudicially suppose that a minimum quantity is administered which being absorbed into the system destroys life should you expect to find any in the stomach i should expect sometimes to fail in discovering it if death resulted from a series of minimum doses spread over several days would the appearance of the body be different from that of one whose death had been caused by one dose i should connect the appearance of the body with the final struggle of the last day would you expect a different set of phenomena in cases where death had taken place after a brief struggle and in cases where the struggle had been protracted certainly at the post-mortem examination of which i have spoken we found fluid blood in the veins mr sergeant she is it your theory that in the action of poisoning the poison becomes absorbed and ceases to exist as poison i have thought much upon that question and have not formed a decided opinion but i am inclined to think that it is so a part may be absorbed and a part remain in the stomach unchanged mr sergeant she what chemical reason can you give for your opinion that strychnine after having effected the operation of poisoning ceases to be strychnine in the blood my opinion rests upon the general principle that in acting upon living bodies organic substances such as food and medicine are generally changed in their composition mr sergeant she what are the component parts of strychnine mr baron alderson you will find that in any cyclopedia brother she mr sergeant she have you any reason to believe that strychnine can be decomposed by any sort of putrefying or fermenting process witness i doubt whether it can mr edward d moore examined by mr huddleston about fifteen years ago i was in practice as a surgeon and i attended with dr chambers a gentleman named clutterbuck who was suffering from paralysis we had been giving him small doses of strychnine when he went to brighton on his return he told us that he had been taking larger doses of strychnine and we in consequence gave him a stronger dose i made up three draughts confining a quarter of a grain each he took one in my presence i remained with him a little time and left him and he said he felt quite comfortable about three-quarters of an hour afterwards i was summoned to him i found him stiffened in every limb and the head drawn back he was desirous that we should move and turn him and rub him we tried to give him ammonia in a spoon and he snapped at the spoon he was suffering i should say more than three hours sedatives were given him he survived the attack he was conscious all the time cross-examined by mr sergeant she the spasm ceased in about three hours but the rigidity of the muscles remained till the next day his hands and feet were at first drawn back and he was much easier when we clinched them forwards his paralysis was better after the attack re-examined by the attorney-general strychnine stimulates the nerves which act upon the voluntary muscles and therefore acts beneficially 
in cases of paralysis the attorney general intimated that the next witness to be called was dr taylor and as it was quarter after five the trial was adjourned until monday at nine o'clock lord campbell before the jury left the box exhorted them not to form any opinion upon the case until they had heard both sides they should even abstain from conversing about it among themselves mr sergeant shee said that medical witnesses would be called for the defence his lordship also expressed a hope that if the jury were taken out upon the following day sunday they would not be allowed to go to any place of public resort and mentioned an instance in which a jury under similar circumstances had been conducted to epping forest the court then rose and the jury were conveyed to the london coffee-house end of section eight Section 9 of The Most Extraordinary Trial of William Palmer by Anonymous. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Fifth Day, May the 19th. The court was again crowded long before the commencement of the proceeding this morning. The Earl of Denbigh and Lord Littleton were among the gentlemen who occupied seats upon the bench the jury came into court shortly before ten o'clock and were soon followed by lord campbell and mr justice cresswell accompanied by the recorder the sheriffs and under sheriffs etc mr baron alderson did not take his seat until about two o'clock the prisoner was immediately placed at the bar there was no alteration perceptible in his countenance or demeanour and he took notes of several parts of dr taylor's evidence the attorney general mr e james q c mr wellsby mr bodkin and mr huddleston appeared for the crown mr sergeant shee mr grove q c mr gray and mr keneally for the prisoner dr alfred swain taylor examined by the attorney general i am a fellow of the college of physicians lecturer on medical jurisprudence at guy's hospital and the author of a well-known treatise on poisons and on medical jurisprudence i have made the poison called strychnia the subject of my attention it is the produce of the nux vomica which also contains bruchia a poison of an analogous character bruchia is variously estimated at from one-sixth to one-twelfth the strength of strychnia most varieties of impure strychnia that are sold contain more or less bruchia unless therefore you are certain as to the purity of the article you may be misled as to its strength i have performed a variety of experiments with strychnia on animal life i have never witnessed its action on a human subject i have tried its effects upon animal life upon rabbits in ten or twelve instances the symptoms are on the whole very uniform the quantity i have given has varied from half a grain to two grains half a grain is sufficient to destroy a rabbit i have given it both in a solid and a liquid state when given in a fluid state it produces its effects in a very few minutes when in a solid state as a sort of pill or bolus in about six to eleven minutes the time varies according to the strength of the dose and also to the strength of the animal in what way does it operate in your opinion it is first absorbed into the blood then circulated through the body and especially acts on the spinal cord from which proceed the nerves acting on the voluntary muscles supposing the poison to have been absorbed what time would you give for the circulating process the circulation of the blood through the whole system is considered to take place about once in four minutes the circulation in animals is quicker the absorption of the poison by rabbits is therefore quicker the time would also depend on the stomach whether it contained much food or not 
whether the poison came into immediate contact with the inner surface of the stomach in your opinion does the poison act immediately on the nervous system or must it first be absorbed it must first be absorbed the symptoms you say are uniform will you describe them the animal for about five or six minutes does not appear to suffer but moves about gently when the poison begins to act it suddenly falls on its side there is a trembling a quivering motion of the whole of the muscles of the body arising from the poison producing violent and involuntary contraction there is then a sudden paroxysm or fit the forelegs and the hind legs are stretched out the head and the tail are drawn back in the form of a bow the jaws are spasmodically closed the eyes are prominent after a short time there is a slight remission of the symptoms and the animal appears to lie quiet but the slightest noise or touch reproduces another convulsive paroxysm sometimes there is a scream or a sort of shriek as if the animal suffered from pain the heart beats violently during the fit and after a succession of these fits the animal dies quietly sometimes however the animal dies during a spasm and i only know that death has occurred from holding my hand over the heart the appearances after death differ in some instances the rigidity continues in one case the muscles were so strongly contracted for a week afterwards that it was possible to hold the body by its hind legs stretched out horizontally in an animal killed the other day the body was flaccid at the time of death but became rigid about five minutes afterwards i have opened the bodies of animals thus destroyed could you detect any injury in the stomach no i have found in some cases congestion of the membranes of the spinal cord to a greater extent than would be accounted for by the gravitation of the blood in other cases i have found no departure from the ordinary state of the spinal cord and the brain i ascribe congestion to the succession of fits before death in a majority of instances three out of five i found no change in the abnormal condition of the spine in all cases the heart has been congested especially the right side i saw a case of ordinary tetanus in the human subject years ago but i have not had much experience of such cases i saw one case last thursday week at st bartholomew's hospital the patient recovered you have heard the descriptions given by the witnesses of the symptoms and appearances which accompanied cook's attacks i have were those symptoms and appearances the same as those you have observed in the animals to which you administered strychnine they were death has taken place in the animals more rapidly when the poison has been administered in a fluid than in a solid form they have died at various periods after the administration of the poison the experiments i have performed lately have been entirely in reference to solid strychnine in the first case the symptoms began in seven minutes and the animal died including those seven in thirteen minutes in the second case the symptoms appeared in nine minutes and the animal died in seventeen in the third case the symptoms appeared in ten minutes and the animal died in eighteen in the fourth case the symptoms appeared in five minutes and death took place in twenty-two in the fifth case the symptoms appeared in twelve minutes and death occurred in twenty-three if the poison were taken by the human subject in pills it would take a longer time to act because the structure of the pill must be broken up in order to bring the poison in contact with the mucous membrane of the stomach i have administered it to rabbits in pills would poison given in pills take a longer period to operate on a human subject than on a rabbit i do not think we can draw any inference from a comparison of the rapidity of death in a human subject and in a rabbit the circulation and absorption are different in the two cases there is also a difference between one human subject and another the strength of the dose too would make a difference as a large dose would produce a more rapid effect than a small one 
I have experimented upon the intestines of animals in order to reproduce the strychnia. The process consists in putting the stomach and its contents in alcohol with a small quantity of acid, which dissolves the strychnia and produces sulphate of strychnia in the stomach. The liquid is then filtered, gently evaporated, and an alkali added, carbonate of potash, which, mixed with a small quantity of sulphuric acid, precipitates the strychnia. Tests are applied to the strychnia, or supposed strychnia, when extracted. Strychnia has a peculiar, strongly bitter taste. It is not soluble in water, but it is in acids and in alcohol. The colouring tests are applied to the dry residue after evaporation. Change of colour is produced by a mixture of sulphuric acid and bichromate of potash. It produces a blue colour, changing to violet and purple, and passing to red. But colouring tests are very fallacious, with this exception. When we have strychnine separated in its crystallised state, we can recognise the crystals by their form and their chemical properties, and, above all, by the production of tetanic symptoms and death when administered through a wound in the skin of animals. Are there other vegetable substances from which, if these colouring tests were applied, similar colours would be obtained? There are a variety of mixtures which produce similar colours. One of them has also a bitter taste like strychnia. Vegetable poisons are more difficult of detection by chemical process than mineral poisons. The tests are far more fallacious. I have endeavoured to discover the presence of strychnine in animals I have poisoned in four cases, assisted by Dr. Rees. I have applied the process which I first described. I have then applied the tests of colouring and of taste. Were you able to satisfy yourself on the presence of strychnia? In one case, I discovered some by the colour test. In a second case, there was a bitter taste, but no other indication of strychnia. In the other two cases, there were no indications at all of strychnia. In the case where it was discovered by a colour test, two grains had been administered. And in the second case, where there was a bitter taste, one grain. In one of the cases where we failed to detect it, one grain, and in the other, half a grain had been given. How do you account for the absence of any indication of strychnia in cases where you know it was administered? It is absorbed into the blood and is no longer in the stomach. It is in a great part changed in the blood. How do you account for its presence when administered in large doses? There is a retention of some in excess of what is required for the destruction of life. Supposing a minimum dose which will destroy life has been given, could you find any? No, it is taken up by absorption and is no longer discoverable in the stomach. The smallest quantity by which I have destroyed the life of an animal is half a grain. There is no process with which I am acquainted by which it can be discovered in the tissues. As far as I know, a small quantity cannot be discovered. Suppose half a grain to be absorbed into the blood. What proportion does it bear to the total quantity of blood circulated in the system? Assuming the system to contain the lowest quantity of blood, 25 pounds, it would be one-fiftieth of a grain to a pound of blood. A physician once died from a dose of half a grain in 20 minutes. I believe it undergoes some partial change in the blood, which increases the difficulty of discovering it. I never heard of its being separated from the tissues in a crystallized state. The crystals are peculiar in form, but there are other organic crystallized substances like them, so that a chemist will not rely on the form only. After the post-mortem examination of Cook, a portion of the stomach was sent to me. It was delivered to me by Mr. Boycott in a brown stone jar covered with a bladder, tied and sealed. The jar contained the stomach and the intestines. I have experimented upon them with a view to ascertain if there was any poison present. What poisons did you seek for in the first instance? Various. Prussic acid, oxalic acid, morphia, strychnia, veratria, tobacco poison, hemlock, arsenic, 
antimony mercury and other mineral poisons did you find any of them we only found small traces of antimony were the parts upon which you had to operate in your search for strychnia in a favourable condition the most unfavourable that could possibly be the stomach had been completely cut from end to end all the contents were gone and the fine mucous surface on which any poison if present would have been found was lying in contact with the outside of the intestines all thrown together the inside of the stomach was lying in the mass of intestinal feculent matter that was the fault or misfortune of the person who dissected i presume it was but it seemed to have been shaken about in every possible way in the journey to london the contents of the intestines were there but not the contents of the stomach in which and on the mucous membrane i should have expected to find poison by my own request other portions of the body were sent up to me namely the spleen the two kidneys and a small bottle of blood they were delivered to me by mr boycott we had no idea whence the blood had been taken we analyzed all we searched in the liver and one of the kidneys for mineral poison each part of the liver one kidney and the spleen all yielded antimony the quantity was less in proportion in the spleen than in the other parts it was reproduced or brought out by boiling the animal substance in a mixture of hydrochloric acid and water gall and copper water were also introduced and the antimony was found deposited on the copper we applied various tests to it those of professor brandt of dr rees and others i detected some antimony in the blood it is impossible to say with precision how recently it had been administered but i should say within some days the longest period at which antimony can be found in the blood after death is eight days the earliest period at which it has been found after death within my own knowledge is eighteen hours a boy died within eighteen hours after taking it and it was found in the liver antimony is usually given in the form of tartar emetic it acts as an irritant and produces vomiting if given in repeated doses a portion would find its way into the blood and the system beyond what is ejected if it continued to be given after it had produced certain symptoms it would destroy life it may however be given with impunity i heard the account given by the female servants of the frequent vomiting of mr cook both at rugeley and at shrewsbury and also the evidence of mr gibson and mr jones as to the predominant symptoms in this case vomitings produced by antimony would cause those symptoms if given in small quantities sufficient to cause vomiting it would not affect the colour of the liquid in which it was mixed whether brandy wine broth or water it is impossible to form an exact judgment as to the time when the antimony was administered but it must have been within two or three weeks at the outside before death there was no evidence that any had been given within some hours of death it might leave a sensation in the throat a choking sensation if a large quantity was taken at once i found no trace of mercury during the analysis if a few grains had been taken recently before death i should have expected to find some trace if a man had taken mercury for a syphilitic affection within two or three weeks i should have expected to find it it is very slow in passing out of the body as small a quantity as three or four grains might leave some trace i recollect a case in which three grains of calomel were given three or four hours before death and traces of mercury were found half a grain three or four days before death if favourably given and not vomited would i should expect leave a trace one grain would certainly do so i heard the evidence as to the death of mrs smith agnes french and the other lady mentioned and also as to the attack of clutterbuck from your own experience in reference to strychnine do you coincide in opinion with the other witnesses that the deaths in those cases were caused by strychnine 
yes did the symptoms in cook's case appear to be of a similar character to the symptoms in those cases they did as a professor of medical science do you know any cause in the range of human disease except strychnine to which the symptoms in cook's case can be referred i do not cross-examined by mr sergeant shee i mean by the word trace a very small quantity which can hardly be estimated by weight i do not apply it in the sense of an imponderable quantity in chemical language it is frequently used in that sense an infinitesimal quantity would be called a trace the quantity of antimony that we discovered in all parts of the body would make up about half a grain we did not ascertain that there was that quantity but i will undertake to say that we extracted as much as half a grain that quantity would not be sufficient to cause death only arsenic or antimony could have been deposited under the circumstances on the copper and no sublimate of arsenic was obtained the witness in reply to a further question detailed the elaborate test which he had applied to the deposit in order to ascertain that it consisted of antimony would a mistake in any one of the processes you have described or a defect in any of the materials you used defeat the object of the test it would but all the materials i used were pure such an accident could not have happened without my having some intimation of it in the course of the process i should think antimony would operate more quickly upon animals than upon men i am acquainted with the works of orfila he stood in the highest rank of analytical chemists did not orfila find antimony in a dog four months after injection yes but the animal had taken about forty-five grains mr sergeant shee called the attention of the witness to a passage in orfila's work in reference to that case to the effect that the antimony was found accumulating in the bones the liver contained a great deal and the tissues a very little witness yes when antimony has been long in the body it passes into the bones but i think you will find that these are not orfila's experiments orfila is quoting the experiments of another person but is it not the case with nearly all the experiments referred to in your own book no i cannot say that mr sergeant shee again referred to a case in orfila in which forty-five grains were given to a dog and three and a half months after death a quantity was found in the fat and some in the liver bones and tissues witness that shows that antimony gets into the bones and flesh but i never knew a case in which forty-five grains had been given and i have given no opinion upon such a case a pretty good dose is required to poison a person i suppose that depends on the mode in which it is given a dog has been poisoned with six grains the dog died in the case you mentioned when antimony is administered as it was in that case the liver becomes fatty and gristled cook's liver presented no appearance of the sort i should infer that the antimony we found in cook's body was given much more recently than in the experiments you have described we cannot say positively how long it takes to get out of the body but i have known three grains cleared out in twenty-four hours i was first applied to in this case on thursday the twenty seventh of november by mr stevens who was introduced to me by mr warrington professor of chemistry either then or subsequently he mentioned mr gardiner i had not known mr gardiner before i had never before been concerned in cases of this kind at rugeley mr sergeant shee read the letter written by dr taylor to mr gardiner Quote, chemical laboratory guides hospital december the fourth eighteen fifty five re j p cook esq deceased dear sir dr rees and i have completed the analysis to-day we have sketched a report which will be ready to-morrow or next day as i am going to durham assizes on the part of the crown in the case of regina and wooler the report will be in the hands of dr rees 
number twenty six albemarle street it will be most desirable that mr stevens should call on dr rees read the report with him and put such questions as may occur in reply to your letter received here this morning i beg to say that we wish a statement of all the medicines prescribed for deceased until his death to be drawn up and sent to dr rees we do not find strychnine prussic acid or any trace of opium from the contents having been drained away it is now impossible to say whether any strychnine had or had not been given just before death but it is quite possible for tartar emetic to destroy life if given in repeated doses and so far as we can at present form an opinion in the absence of any natural cause of death the deceased may have died from the effects of antimony in this or some other form we are dear sir yours faithfully alfred s taylor g owen rees was that your opinion at the time it was we could infer nothing else have you not said that the quantity of antimony you found was not sufficient to account for death certainly if a man takes antimony he first vomits and then a part of the antimony goes out of the body some may escape from the bowels a great deal passes at once into the blood by absorption and is carried out by the urine can you say upon your oath that from the traces in cook's body you were justified in stating your opinion that death was caused by antimony yes perfectly and distinctly that which is found in a dead body is not the slightest criterion as to what the man took when he was alive when you gave your opinion that cook died from the effects of antimony had you any reason to think that an undue quantity had been administered i could not tell people may die from large or small quantities the quantity found in the body was no criterion as to how much he had taken may not the injudicious use of a quack medicine containing antimony the injudicious use of james's powders account for the antimony you found in the body yes the injudicious use of any antimonial medicine would account for it or even their judicious use it might with that knowledge upon being consulted with regard to cook you gave it as your opinion that he died from the poison of antimony you pervert my meaning entirely i said that antimony in the form of tartar emetic might occasion vomiting and other symptoms of irritation and that in large doses it would cause death preceded by convulsions the witness was proceeding to read his report upon the case but was stopped by the court i was told that the deceased was in good health seven or eight days before his death and that he had been taken very sick and ill and had died in convulsions no further particulars being given to us we were left to suppose that he had not died a natural death there was no natural cause to account for death and finding antimony existing throughout the body we thought it might have been caused by antimony an analysis cannot be made effectually without information you think it necessary before you can rely upon an analysis to have received a long statement of the symptoms before death a short statement will do you allow your judgment to be influenced by the statement of a person who knows nothing of his own knowledge i do not allow my judgment to be influenced in any way i judge by the result do you mean to state that what mr stevens told you did not assist you in arriving at the conclusion you state in writing i stated it as a possible cause not as a certainty if we had found a very large quantity of tartar emetic in the stomach we should have come to the conclusion that the man had died from it as we found only a small quantity we said he might have died from it i attended the inquest on the body of mr cook i think i first attended on the fourteenth of december some of the evidence was read over to me i think that dr harland was the first witness i heard examined i heard mr bamford examined and also lavinia barnes i cannot say as to newton i heard jones 
I had experimented some years ago on five of the rabbits I have mentioned. That is about twenty-three years ago. That is the only knowledge of my own that I had of the effect of strychnia upon animal life. I have a great objection to the sacrifice of life. No toxicologist will sacrifice the lives of a hundred rabbits to establish facts which he knows to be already well established. I experimented upon the last rabbits since the inquest. Do you not think that is a very slight experiment? You must add to experiment the study of poisons and cases. Do not you think that a rabbit is a very unfair animal to select? No. Would not a dog be much better? Dogs are very dangerous to handle. A laugh. Do you mean to give that answer? Dogs and cats bear a greater analogy to man because they vomit, while rabbits do not, but rabbits are much more manageable. Mr. Sergeant Shee, I will take your answer that you are afraid of dogs. Witness, after the experiments I have tried with dogs and cats, I have no inclination to go on. Do you admit that as to the action of the respiratory organs, they would be better than rabbits? I do not. As to the effect of the poison, would they not? I think a rabbit is quite as good as any animal. The poison is retained, and its operation is shown. At the inquest, I saw Mr. Gardner. I suggested questions to the coroner. Some of them he put to the witnesses, and others they answered upon my suggestion of them. Ten days before the inquest, Mr. Gardner informed me, in his letter, that strychnia, Batley's solution, and prussic acid had been purchased on the Tuesday. That is why I use the expressions to which you have referred. We did not allow that information to have any influence upon our report. At the request of Mr. Sergeant Shee, the deposition of this witness taken at the coroner's inquest was read by the clerk of arraigns. Cross-examination continued. Having given my evidence, I returned to town, and soon afterwards heard that the prisoner had been committed on a charge of willful murder. And that his life depended in a great degree upon you? No. I simply gave an opinion as to the poison, not as to the prisoner's case. I knew that I should probably be examined as a witness upon this trial. Do you think it your duty to abstain from all public discussion of the question which might influence the public mind? Yes. Did you write a letter to the Lancet? Yes, to contradict several misstatements of my evidence which had been made. This letter, which appeared in the Lancet of February the 2nd, 1856, was put in by Mr. Sergeant Shee and read by the Clerk of Arraigns. The principal part of the letter referred to the case of Mrs. Anne Palmer, the concluding paragraph for which Mr. Sergeant Shee stated that he desired it should be read was as follows. Quote, During the quarter of a century which I have now specially devoted to toxicological inquiries, I have never met with any case like these suspected cases of poisoning at Rugeley. The mode in which they will affect the person accused is of minor importance compared with the profitable influence on society. I have no hesitation in saying that the future security of life in this country will mainly depend on the judge, the jury, and the counsel who may have to dispose of the charges of murder which have arisen out of these investigations. End quote. Cross examination continued. That is my opinion now. It had been stated that if strychnia caused death, it could always be found, which I deny. It had also been circulated in every newspaper that a person could not be killed by tartar emetic, which I deny, and which might have led to the destruction of hundreds of lives. I entertain no prejudice against the prisoner. What I meant was that if these statements which I have seen in medical and other periodicals were to have their way, there was not a life in the country which was safe. Do you adhere to your opinion that the mode in which they will affect the person accused, that is, lead him to the scaffold, 
is of minor importance compared with their probable influence on society i have never suggested that they should lead him to the scaffold i hope that if innocent he will be acquitted what do you mean by the mode in which they will affect the person accused being of minor importance the lives of sixteen million of people are in my opinion of greater importance than that of one man that is your opinion yes as you appear to put that as an objection to my evidence allow me to state that in two dead bodies i find antimony in one case death occurred suddenly and in the other the body was saturated with antimony which i never found before in the examination of three hundred bodies i say these were circumstances which demanded explanation you adhere to the opinion that as a medical man and a member of an honourable profession you were right in publishing this letter before the trial of the person accused i think i had a right to state that opinion in answer to the comments which had been made upon my evidence had any comments been made by the prisoner no or by any of his family mr smith the solicitor for the defence circulated in every paper statements of dr taylor's inaccuracy i had no wish or motive to charge the prisoner with this crime my duty concerns the lives of all do you know mr augustus mayhew the editor of the illustrated times i have seen him once or twice did you allow pictures of yourself and dr rees to be taken for publication be so good as to call them caricatures no i did not mr sergeant shee there may be a difference of opinion as to that i think it is very like did you receive mr mayhew at your house he came to me with a letter of introduction from professor faraday i never received him in my laboratory did you know that he called in order that you might afford him information for an article in the illustrated times i swear solemnly i did not the publication of that article was the most disgraceful thing i ever knew i had never seen him before nor did i know that he was the editor of the illustrated times on your oath on my oath it was the greatest deception that was ever practised on a scientific man it was disgraceful he called on me in company with another gentleman with a letter from professor faraday i received him as i should professor faraday and entered into conversation with him about these cases he represented as i understood that he was connected with an insurance company and wished for information about a number of cases of poisoning which had occurred during many years after we had conversed about an hour he asked if there was any objection to the publication of these details still believing him to be connected with an insurance office i replied that so far as the correction of error was concerned i should have no objection to anything appearing on that evening he went away without telling me that he was the editor of the illustrated times or connected with any other paper i did not know that until he called upon me on thursday morning and showed me the article in print i remonstrated verbally with him he only showed me part of a slip i told him i objected to its publication and struck out all that i saw regarding these cases he afterwards put the article into the shape in which it appeared i could not prevent his publishing the results of our conversation on points not connected with these cases you did permit him to publish part of the slip nothing connected with the rugeley cases did he show you the slip of our interview with dr a taylor i do not remember seeing that i will swear that to the best of judgment and belief he did not he showed me a slip containing part of what appeared in that article i struck out all which referred to the rugeley cases i thought i had been deceived a person came with a letter of introduction from a scientific man and extracted information from me why did you not tell your servant to show him the door until we had had the conversation i did not know anything about the deception it was not until the thursday morning that i knew he was connected with a paper 
he told me it was an illustrated paper did you correct what he showed you i struck out some portions and allowed the rest to be published i said i had nothing to do with it but i objected to its publication peremptorily no i said i do not like this mode of putting the matter i cannot however interfere with what you put into your journal did you not protest as a gentleman a man of honour and a medical man that it was wrong and objectionable to do it i told him that i objected to the parts which referred to the rugeley cases it was most dishonourable did you not know that in the month of february an interview with dr taylor on the subject of poison must be taken to apply to those cases i did not think anything about it i thought it was a great cheat to extract from me that information mr mayhew was with me about twenty minutes or half an hour on the thursday morning i remonstrated with him i was not angry with him in the sense of quarrelling did you allow him to publish this quote, dr taylor here requested us to state that although the practice of secret poisoning appeared to be on the increase it should be remembered that by analysis the chemist could always detect the presence of poison in the body End quote. i did not request him to state anything of the kind i do not remember whether that was on the slip had i seen it i should have struck it out i remember seeing on the slip quote, and that when analysis fails as in cases where small doses of strychnia had been administered physiology and pathology would invariably suffice to establish the cause of death End quote. i did not strike that out i did not think of it circulating among the class of persons from whom jurors would be selected i think the public ought to know that chemical analyses are not the only tests on which they can rely i don't remember the passage quote, murder by poison could be detected as readily as murder in the, any other form while the difficulty of detecting and convicting the murderer was felt in other cases as well as in those where poison was employed End quote. the article has been very much altered it was a disgraceful thing i have not seen mr mayhew since seeing in the times an advertisement stating that this information had been given by me i wrote to him demanding its withdrawal and that demand was complied with that was on the thursday or friday did you say to a gentleman named cook evans that you would give them strychnia enough before they had done or words to that effect no i do not know the person or to any one no i never use any expression so vulgar and improper you have been greatly misinstructed or he will have strychnia enough before i have done with him it is utterly false the person who suggested that question to you mr johnson has been guilty of other falsehoods in the letter to sir george grey and on other occasions he has misrepresented my statements and evidence what did you do with the medical report to which you referred it was a private letter from dr harland to mr stevens mr justice cresswell it was a memoranda made by dr harland at the time cross-examination continued cook's symptoms were quite in accordance with an ordinary case of poisoning by strychnia can you tell me of any case in which a patient after being seized with tetanic symptoms sat up in bed and talked it was after he sat up that cook was seized with those symptoms can you refer to a case in which such a person who had taken strychnia beat the bed with his or her arms it is exactly what i should expect to arise from a sense of suffocation do you know any case in which the symptoms of poisoning by strychnia commenced with this beating of the bedclothes there have been only about fifteen cases and in none of those was the patient seized in bed beating of the bedclothes is a symptom which may be exhibited by a person suffering from a sense of suffocation whether caused by strychnia or other causes a case has been communicated to me by a friend in which the patient shook as though he had the ague mr sergeant shee objected to the last answer but as the learned sergeant had been questioning the witness as to the results of his reading the court ruled that the evidence was admissible 
cross-examination continued i have known of no case of poisoning by strychnia in which the patient screamed before he was seized that is common in ordinary convulsions in cases of poisoning by strychnia the patient screams when the spasm set in the pain is very severe i cannot refer to a case in which the patient has spoken freely after the paroxysms had commenced can you refer me to any case in an authentic publication in which the access of the strychnia paroxysm has been delayed so long after the ingestion of the poison as in the case of cook on the tuesday night yes longer in my book on medical jurisprudence page one hundred and eighty five of the fifth edition it is stated that in a case communicated to the lancet august thirty first eighteen fifty by mr bennett a grain and a half of strychnia taken by mistake destroyed the life of a healthy young female in an hour and a half none of the symptoms appeared for an hour there is a case in which the period which elapsed was two hours and a half it was not a fatal case but that does not affect the question a grain and a half is a full but not a very considerable dose in my book on poisons there is no case in which the paroxysms commenced more than half an hour after the ingestion of the poison that book is eight years old and since eighteen forty eight cases have occurred there is a mention of one in which three hours elapsed before the paroxysms occurred mr sergeant shee then referred to this case and called attention to the fact that the only statement as to time was that in three hours the patient lost his speech and at length was seized with violent tetanic convulsions cross-examination continued i know of no other fatal case in which the interval was so long in that case there was disease of the brain referring to the lancet i find that in the case to which i referred as communicated by dr bennett the strychnia was dissolved in cinnamon water being dissolved one would have expected it to have a more speedy action the time in which a patient would recover would depend entirely upon the dose of strychnia which had been taken i do not remember any case in which a patient recovered in three or four hours but such cases must have occurred there is one mentioned in my book on medical jurisprudence the patient had taken nux vomica but its powers depend upon strychnia in that case the violence of the paroxysms gradually subsided and the next day although feeble and exhausted the patient was able to walk home the time of the recovery is a point which is not usually stated by medical men i cannot mention any case in which there was a repetition of the paroxysms after so long an interval as that from monday to tuesday night which occurred in cook's case i do not think that the attack on tuesday night was the result of anything which had been administered to him on the monday night in the cases of four out of five rabbits the spasms were continued at the time of death and after death in the other the animal was flaccid at the time of death are you acquainted with this opinion of dr christison that in these cases rigidity does not come on at the time of death but comes on shortly afterwards dr christison speaks from his experience and i from mine did you hear that dr bamford said that when he arrived he found the body of cook quite straight in bed yes can that have been a case of ophistotinus it may have been are not the colour tests of strychnia so uncertain and fallacious that they cannot be depended upon yes unless you first get the strychnia in a visible and tangible form is it not impossible to get it so from the stomach it is not impossible it depends upon the quantity which remains there you do not agree that the fiftieth part of a grain might be discovered i think not nor even half a grain that might be it would depend upon the quantity of food in the stomach with which it was mixed re-examined by the attorney-general in case of death from strychnia the heart is sometimes found empty after death that is the case of human subjects there are three such cases on record i think that emptiness results from spasmodic affection of the heart i know of no reason why that should rather occur in the case of man 
than in that of a small animal like a rabbit the heart is generally more filled when the paroxysms are more frequent when the paroxysm is short and violent and causes death in a few moments i should expect to find the heart empty the rigidity after death always affects the same muscles those of the limbs and back in the case of the rabbit in which the rigidity was relaxed at the time of death it returned while the body was warm in ordinary death it only appears when the body is cold or nearly so i never knew a case of tetanus in which the rigidity lasted two months after death but such a fact would give me the impression that there were very violent spasms it would indicate great violence of the spasms from which the person died the time which elapses between the taking of strychnia and the commencement of the paroxysms depends on the constitution and strength of the individual a feeling of suffocation is one of the earliest symptoms of poisoning by strychnia and that would lead the patient to beat the bedclothes i have no doubt that the substances i used for the analysis were pure i had tested them the fact that in three distinct processes each gave the same result was strong confirmation of each i have no doubt that what we found was antimony the quantity found does not enable me to say how much was taken it might be the residue of either large or small doses sickness would throw off some portion of the antimony which had been administered we did not analyze the bones and tissues why did you suggest questions to the coroner he did not put questions which enabled me to form an opinion i think that arose rather from want of knowledge than from intention there was an omission to take down the answers i made no observation upon that subject at the time i wrote to mr gardiner i had not learnt the symptoms which attended the attack and death of cook i had only the information that he was well seven days before he died and had died in convulsions i had no information which could lead me to suppose that strychnia had been the cause of death except that palmer had purchased strychnia failing to find opium prussic acid or strychnia i referred to antimony as the only substance found in the body before writing to the lancet i had been made the subject of a great many attacks what i said as to the possibility or impossibility of discovering strychnia after death had been misrepresented in various newspapers it had been represented that i had said that strychnia could never be detected that it was destroyed by putrefaction what i said was that when absorbed into the blood it could not be separated as strychnia i wrote the letter for my own vindication End of section nine section ten of the most extraordinary trial of william palmer by anonymous this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lynn thompson fifth day may the nineteenth part two dr g o rees examined by mr e james q c said i am lecturer on materia medica at guy's hospital and i assisted dr taylor in making the post-mortem examination referred to by that gentleman and he has most correctly stated the result i was present during the whole time and at the discovery of the antimony i am of opinion that it may have been administered within a few days or a few hours of mr cook's death all the tests we employed failed to discover the presence of strychnia the stomach was in a most unfavourable state for examination it was cut open and turned inside out its mucous surface was lying upon the intestines and the contents of the stomach if there had been any must have been thrown among the intestines and mixed with them these circumstances were very unfavourable to the hope of discovering strychnia i agree with dr taylor as to the manner in which strychnia acts upon the human frame and i am of opinion that it may be taken either by accident or design sufficient to destroy life and no trace of it be found after death i was present at the experiments made by dr taylor upon the animals 
and at the endeavour to detect it in the stomachs afterwards. We failed to do so in three cases out of four. The symptoms accompanying the death of the animals were very similar to those described in the case of Mr. Cook. I have heard the cases that have been mentioned in this court, and the symptoms in every one of them are analogous to those in the case of Mr. Cook. Cross-examined by Mr. Grove, QC. I did not see either of the animals reject any portion of the poison, but I heard that in one case the animal did reject a portion. I have no facts to state upon which I formed the opinion that the poison acts by absorption. Professor Brand, examined by Mr. Wellesby. I am Professor of Chemistry at the Royal Institution. I was not present at the analysis of the liver, spleen, etc. of the deceased but the report of dr taylor and dr rees was sent to me for my inspection afterwards i was present at one of the analyses we examined in the first place the action of copper upon a very weak solution of antimony and we ascertained that there was no action until the solution was slightly acidified by muriatic acid and heated the antimony was then deposited and i am enabled to state positively that the deposit was antimony by the attorney general the experiment i refer to was made for the purpose of testing the accuracy of the test that had already been applied and it was perfectly satisfactory professor christison said i am a fellow of the royal college of physicians and professor of materia medica at the university of edinburgh i am also the author of a work on the subject of poisons and i have directed a good deal of attention to strychnia in my opinion it acts by absorption into the blood and through that upon the nervous system i have seen its effects on a human subject but not a fatal case i have seen it tried upon pigs rabbits cats and one wild boar a laugh i first directed my attention to this poison in eighteen twenty in paris it had been discovered two years before in paris in most of my experiments upon animals i gave very small doses a sixth of a grain but i once administered a grain i cannot say how small a dose would cause the death of an animal by administration into the stomach i generally applied it by injection through an incision in the cavity of the chest a sixth part of a grain so administered killed a dog in two minutes i once administered to a rabbit through the stomach a dose of a grain i saw dr taylor administer three-quarters of a grain to a rabbit and it was all swallowed except a very small quantity the symptoms are nearly the same in rabbits cats and dogs the first is a slight tremor and unwillingness to move then frequently the animal jerks its head back slightly soon after that all the symptoms of tetanus come on which have been so often described by the previous witnesses when the poison is administered by the stomach death generally takes place between a period of five minutes and five and twenty minutes after the symptoms first make their appearance i have frequently opened the bodies of animals thus killed and have never been able to trace any effect of the poison upon the stomach or intestines or upon the spinal cord or brain that i could attribute satisfactorily to the poison the heart of the animal generally contained blood in all the cases in which i have been concerned in the case of the wild boar the poison was injected into the chest a third of a grain was all that was used and in ten minutes the symptoms began to show themselves if strychnia was administered in the form of a pill it might be mixed with other ingredients that would protract the period of its operation this would be the case if it were mixed with resinous materials or any materials that were difficult of digestion and such materials would be within the knowledge of any medical men and they are frequently used for the purpose of making ordinary pills absorption in such a case would not commence until the pill was broken down by the process of digestion in the present state of our knowledge of the subject i do not think it is possible to fix the precise time when the operation of the poison commences on a human subject in the case of an animal we take care that it is fasting and we mix the poison with ingredients that are readily soluble and every circumstance favourable for the development of the poison i have seen many cases of tetanus arising from wounds and other causes 
the general symptoms of the disorder very nearly resemble each other and in all the natural forms of tetanus the symptoms begin and advance much more slowly and they prove fatal much more slowly and there is no intermission in certain forms of natural tetanus in tetanus from strychnia there are short intermissions i have heard the evidence of what took place at the talbot arms on the monday and tuesday and the result of my experience induces me to come to the conclusion that the symptoms exhibited by the deceased were only attributable to strychnia or the four poisons containing it the witness gave the technical names of the poisons he referred to there is no natural disease of any description that i am acquainted with to which i could refer these symptoms in cases of tetanus consciousness remains to the very last moment when death takes place in a human subject by spasm it tends to empty the heart of blood when death is the consequence of the administration of strychnia if the quantity is small i should not expect to find any trace in the body after death if there was an excess of quantity more than was required to cause the death by absorption i should expect to find that excess in the stomach the colour tests for the detection of the presence of strychnia are uncertain vegetable poisons are much more difficult of detection than mineral ones and there is one poison with which i am acquainted for which no known test has been discovered the stomach of the deceased was sent in a very unsatisfactory state for examination and there must have been a considerable quantity of strychnia in the stomach to have enabled any one to detect its presence under such circumstances cross-examined the experiments i referred to were made many years ago in one instance i tried one of the colour tests in the case of a man who was poisoned by strychnia but i failed to discover the presence of the poison in the stomach i tried the test for the development of the violet colour by means of sulphuric acid and oxide of lead from my own observation i should say that animals destroyed by strychnia die of asphyxia but in my work which has been referred to it will be seen that i have left the question open some further questions were put to the witness by the learned counsel for the prisoner in reference to opinions expressed by him in his work and he explained that his work was written twelve years ago and that the experience he had since obtained had modified some of the opinions he then entertained cross-examination continued i have not noticed that in cases where a patient is suffering from strychnia the slightest touch appears to bring on the paroxysm it is so remarkably in the case of animals unless you touch them very gently indeed strychnia has a most intensely bitter taste it is said on the authority of a french chemist that a grain will give a taste to more than a gallon of water if resinous substances were used in the formation of a pill it does not follow that they would necessarily be found in the stomach they might be passed off by the attorney-general one of the cases referred to in the work that has been referred to was that of a gamekeeper who was found dead his head was thrown back his hands were clinched and his limbs were rigid a paper containing strychnia was found in his pocket and upon a post-mortem examination there were indications which under the circumstances satisfied him of the existence of strychnia there was a substance in the body of an intense bitter which was tested by the colour test and it succeeded in one instance but failed in another i have no doubt that colour tests are not to be relied on the trial was then again adjourned at six o'clock until the following tuesday morning at ten o'clock the jury were taken as on the former occasions to the london coffee-house in the charge of the officers of the court End of section ten.